So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and American League Baseball, capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I knew there was something missing in my life since it became Facebook, Twitter, Orkut, Bebo, and instant messaging centric, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what. Turns out it's people. You know, real life high fiving, handshaking, back slapping, uh, refrigerator rating friends, neighbors, and family. Jean Martinet, the author of The Art of Mingling, just published a new book, Life is Friends. I suspect it will become one of those gems that is found on everyone's bookshelf or ebook reader in the future. It's a lively read, and it's full of great anecdotal advice. Jean, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm great. So uh, I guess it would be pointless to asking uh, how many Facebook friends you have, because you probably don't mess with that stuff, right? <laughs> I don't. I get a lot of flack for not being on Facebook. People, people uh, every day tell me, why aren't you on Facebook? And um, <laughs> I, I just uh, I haven't gone that way because I... I figure there's only a certain amount of hours in the day, and um, I don't want to spend several of them online every day doing that. It's okay. You're not hurting my feelings at all. <laughs> don't, don't feel guilty about what you're saying, that it affects me at well, all. I'm not, well, I'm not going to take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're certainly, Facebook is wonderful for, um, as are all of those kinds of sites, for um, finding old friends that you've lost and for you know, reconnecting with people. But um, I think many people spend way too much time on Facebook. Um, when, you know, there are a certain amount of socializing hours in the day, and I think, as my book says, that fa face-to-face socializing is more, uh, more rewarding and more important to us in the end. I also don't like having to, um, you know, they, you have to, when people say, I want to be your friend, you have to reject or, was it reject or accept? And I don't want to be in the position of having to tell people that I want to be their friend. <laughs> oh, it's, it's such an empowering situation. I mean, can you imagine there's people who the only power in their life is rejecting people who want to be their friends on Facebook? <laughs> I would have eternal guilt. I'd be guilty all the time. I feel guilty all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So what, what is the toughest social, social situation you've ever encountered? Let's just jump right in. Um, yes, the toughest face-to-face -to -face social situation I've ever encountered? Sure. Um, I would have to say I was taken by um, New York Times columnist at the time, um, Bob Morris, to practice my, prove my mingling skills at a celebrity party a couple of years ago. And I had, he was standing by me with a pad of paper, and I had a photographer over my other shoulder. And with that behind me, I, had to, um, I was supposed to go up and, and mingle to people um, like Candace Bergen. <laughs> and it was the most important. They saw me. They didn't know, didn't know who I was. And they saw me with um, with this photographer and a reporter, fairly famous reporter, and they all just like scattered. <laughs> it was, and then, meanwhile, you know, I was then it was reported that you know I my that I was sort of uh, got an A for trying, but wasn't a great mingler. But that was because there was a photographer following me around. So that was well, tough. Really. Who, I assume that was the reporter's idea because I'm sure that's not the situation you would have put yourself. No, in. no, and that was that was the reporter's idea. It made for a great article, actually. It was really, it was, it was really fun. But I'm saying it was definitely a tough mingling situation. It was challenging. Oh, it sounds, well, yeah, I was going to say it sounds terribly contrived. I mean, it's kind of like these reality shows. Like if I show up and God forbid I become a reality show, but if I show up at an event and I'm being followed around with a, by a camera, a sound person, and a director. Uh, any any common activity I, I choose to partake in is is blown out of proportion. So no, yeah. it was it was it was really it was quite it was sort of silly, but it was a great it was a nice piece. And um, Bob's a great writer, so it ended up okay in the end. So you just have to say that because he might write about you again. Right? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> or or, you, or you're nice to everybody named Bob. That actually, no, Bob. Actually, Bob Morris is a great writer, and um, okay. he he's a, a wonderful, funny writer. And he actually gave me a quote for my new book, Life is Friends. Well, it's because he owed you for putting you in a ridiculous situation. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I know we've got a number of people. There's a live web chat that accompanies uh, the Mr. Media interviews. A number of people there. I want to make sure everybody knows. If you've got a comment or question. 
Dr. Jean Martinet, uh, author of The Art of Mingling and Life as Friends. Please give us a call, 1-646-595-3135. You can probably see that number on your screen anyway. Uh, you can also uh, submit questions in the web chat, and I will do my best to ask Jean. Uh, don't ask anything about Bob Morris in the New York Times, so I don't want him to come after me next. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll also point out that you can learn more about Jean, who may be Facebook... Um, May, may steer away from Facebook, but she does have a website. It's www.jean, J-E-A-N-N-E, Martinet, M-A-R-T-I-N-E-T, solid, jeanmartinet.com. Um, I suspect, you know, with the two books out, that you've become one of those people who is bombarded with questions about dealing with uh, awkward situations, kind of in the same way that dermatologists are asked, does this mole look like cancer to you, Doc? <laughs> yes, I, I am. And I, actually, I love answering questions like that, though, because um, it's an area that I obviously like very much. And I also don't mind – I mean, I don't want people to think I'm a Luddite just because I don't believe that, <laughs> that socializing should be done online. A lot of other things, a, great, uh, a lot of other communi- forms of communication are um, – you know, the Internet is perfect and wonderful for them, such mm. as answering people's questions about socializing. Mm-hmm. But um, it's only it's only the the actual real relationships I think people should take offline. Well, you know, you know, I'm just thinking about that. I don't want to get too far off off topic here with this Facebook thing, but hey. I have to say, in defense of Facebook, um, <clears throat> I'm glad that it stays online and not personal because, like in the last few months, <clears throat> sorry, I've actually heard from a number of girls I went to high school with, and I think I prefer keeping them at a distance. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's some. There's some lovely young ladies. Well, of course, none of us are that young anymore. But um, the idea that uh, you know, if they could just show up, I don't, I don't really need that. You know, well, hi, they how wouldn't. Are but, you? <laughs> but before Facebook, they wouldn't have shown up either online or else or otherwise. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I figure it's nice to be remembered, but I think I think most of it needs to stop there. Yeah. Well, no, it's it's great for for um, it's great for for finding out where old people are. That's it. So to follow what I was asking you a minute yeah. ago, though, uh, what kind of things have people asked you in social situations when they find out that you're, you know, obviously you're, you have expertise in, in mingling and socializing. What are some of the stranger things people have asked you, though, in, in parties? And, and well, um, I don't know about strange things. People usually ask me, the, the questions range from what do you do? The, the most common question people ask me is what do you do when – you are talking at a party with someone and you and you want to get away, uh, or you were you've made a horrible faux pas, such as the number one faux pas in America, um, as, asking someone about their pregnancy when they're not pregnant. Oh, oh. <laughs> or you know, or there's all kinds of complicated questions about um, uh, that I deal with in my new book about what to do when you want to invite one person to a dinner party, but. They actually know other friends of yours, and you know you, you feel like are you obligated to invite those other ones? And you know what to do when someone comes to your dinner party and they drink too much and start making rude comments? And you know they're all the questions are are vast. The range is vast. You had a great you have a great anecdote in there. Uh, I think it's relative to what you're talking about, where uh, there, there's someone was having a like a party and uh, they invited uh, this one and that one. And realized before it was too late that these two had had a they had been my like college friends and they had a had a oh yeah had, had a you know? yeah had, they had yeah. had a falling out and they actually right. hadn't spoken to each other for maybe ten twelve years and then there they were um you know on the on the same patio on the spring day <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that was that was a, the host on that in that in that case the host did the appropriate thing which was to um. I mean, they, they were lucky that the, the two people were willing to, at that point, I think they were ready to make up. But the, 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 the hosts were a husband and wife, and the husband took the man aside, and the wife took the woman aside, and they, and they sort of said, hi, I'm so sorry, you could, you, I'm so glad you could come, and, you know, hope this isn't awkward, and then everything was fine. Well, that's amazing. It did have a happy ending. Yes. Doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> no. But if you're, you know, the, you know, the, as you as you know, I'm sure from looking at the book, the um, a lot of the the focus on my book is on being a good host and a good guest because since I'm trying to get people back into um, socializing at their homes rather than online or in restaurants, um, people a lot of times people I think have forgotten how to be good hosts and guests. 
Well, and I want to ask you about something else you just mentioned about uh, dealing with guests. I, I know this rarely happens in America, but dealing with guests who've had too much to drink. Yeah. <laughs> um, the well, the most important rule is to you can't get you really can't um, once a person is drunk, you can't <laughs> talk to them about their drunkenness. Number one. And you can't really make them stop drinking too much without, you know, beginning into a wrestling match with the bottle. Um, what you can do is just um, encourage them to go home on, in some kind of mm, subtle, so, subtle way. You don't have to be too subtle with a drunk because they'll never they, – they, they, their subtleties are lost on most people who are really drunk. But, um, you know, you basically call them a cab and say, thank you so much for coming. Be very nice and friendly. Don't be, get into a conflict and – Try and get them out of your house before they fall asleep on your couch. Uh, it's also good if you can sort of enlist the help of, if it's possible to enlist the help of your other of your co of your guests. However, if the you know a lot of people get the people get very drunk and they they're not bothering anybody, that's fine. <laughs> it's only when they get drunk and obnoxious. There's a good drunk and a bad drunk. Mm. I so I, as I was reading through the book, I was thinking I wish I had this 20 years ago when I was. I'm a little better about stuff now, but boy, I could really use this kind of advice. Uh, not so much on the drunk part, because I'm not a drinker, right. but um, you know, dealing with people like that. And then one of my favorite things in here is the section on having an exit strategy, uh, mm-hmm. because boy, I, I, I left a lot of parties early, and I was always dying for a good good reason to leave. Uh, right. Things were just boring. You know, you describe the situation of you get to the party and, and you have. You know, maybe you have high hopes for it, and then pretty much everybody's just sitting uncomfortably on chairs. You know, and it's right. like, oh god, get <laughs> I know it's me like, out of here. I know, I know that's a party from hell. Um, I like to do to do what I what I I call, I've, have called at some point um, taking a life raft along. And what that is is when you get to the party, when you first get to the party, or even before you go to the party, when you're RCPing to the party, you say. Um, I would love to come to your party. I have to warn you that I have an out-of-town guest coming in from the airport, and I may have to leave to go get them, or some other kind of excuse like that where it's a mandatory nice thing you're doing for someone else. Or A lot of people have, um, have taken me to task for, um, for encouraging lying in all of my techniques, but a little bit of white lying is what I think you know, keeps society from falling apart. <laughs> Is that along the same lines as uh, good fences make good neighbors? Yeah, <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I've left a few parties. And some people I know, uh, it's kind of like, uh, and this would be a whole other book, but uh, I know there are guys who uh, worry about going on like a blind date or they're going on a date that they don't think it's going to go well, so they prearrange for someone to call them about 45 minutes 30, I know. You know, it's it's funny that that whole fake call thing has gotten to be so so much common knowledge now that it's almost if you get a real call, people are not going to believe it because it's so. It's still <laughs> better than just getting up and saying, "Okay, well, bye." But it's it's pretty it's a pretty obvious ploy now because people have used it a lot. <laughs> but it's still it still works. It's still better. That's the thing. Even if that's the thing about white lying. Even if people suspect you're making it up, it's still more polite to make an excuse than to simply get up and leave or say, um, this party's not for me, I'm leaving. You know, you, mm. even if they can see through your excuse, it's still what you're supposed to do. Now, um, Jean, what is, what's the difference between uh, the new book, Life is Friends, and your first book, The Art of Mingling? Is it, is it basically a continuation or is it completely different uh, material? Well, it's sort of a continuation. I sort of think of it in my own mind as, you know, mis- as the, the art of mingling grows up. I mean, for for a long time, uh, that book has been out for a long time, so I, I, I wrote about it and spoke a lot of, about it a lot. And I finally realized a few years ago that what people really, people's mingle phobia and people's desire to be good at parties and so on, the, the deeper um, thing there was that people really wanted to make connections and relationships. So I started getting more um, interested in what happened after the party. You know, do how many of the re- those people you meet at the party can you really take and become friends with, lifelong friends with, and how do you do that? And so, the, and and this this book this new book is also a lot has a, it has a lot of of stuff about uh, maintaining friendships and you know when you should forgive your friends and letting friends go. It has some other more serious things in it too. But I became more interested in writing about friendship than 
because it was the, the sort of deeper area. Hmm. Do you find that uh, people as they get older, uh, some people anyway, that they get older and they become a little more inhibited about even reaching out to people that they've known a long time, you know, that they've, they've had these relationships, but, you know, time gets in the way and they haven't talked in a while, and then it becomes harder and harder as we get older to, uh, you know, re- reestablish uh, what were once close friendships? I think it does. I think people, when, when you get older, you get, you get lazier, you get more set in your ways, and, you know, it's, if it's easier, there's, I also, sorry to blame technology again, but there is, a certain, I think in past generations it was easier because people, but from pure loneliness and boredom, would reach out to people more than they do now. I mean, if you have three wonderful DVDs waiting for you and a pizza just a phone call away, you know, and a comfortable chair, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to think, you know, what, what's missing? You don't know that, you, that this is what's missing. You, you, you lose the whole socializing urge sometimes. Um, and, and I do think that people, especially people in couples have told me that, you know, they spend a lot of time, um, their whole lives, you know, managing their kids and, you know, micromanaging them sometimes and, you know, driving them to soccer and spend every single second with, uh, doing that. And then the kids go off to college and the husband and the wife sort of look at each other and go, well, wait a minute, we don't have any friends <laughs> or, you know, so it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you've ended, ended up making really good friends with the parents of, your kids' friends, but, you know, you've had lots of times you haven't had time to develop those friendships. And friendships that are really, that are deep, intimate friendships really do take, I won't want to say effort, but they take, uh, they take time and engagement. Mm. I, I, I uh, you know, for all the kidding about uh, Facebook, I mean, I, I have placed great value in uh, long-time friends and, and uh, what I what I like best about having real friends that you can meet with in person is that if you've known them for a while you can and they're good friends you can always pick up exactly where you left off and you don't have to go through all the crap you do with new friends <laughs> right exactly you don't have to talk statistics you know all the statistics are already known so you can just like start talking and it's really wonderful and the you know the other reason that, that I encourage people to have dinner parties in this book is um and many people are having dinner parties. It's not that the dinner party is quite dead. It's just dying. Um, is that when you, when you have a dinner party that lasts, where you're eating together at someone's house over a period of four, to, four, year, four years, God, <laughs> four year, a four-year dinner party, that would be a long That's one. That's a long party. <laughs> four hours. Um, by the end sounds of like, that. Sounds like the Bush administration. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. That would not be a dinner party I want to go to. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> the um, you know, by the by the fourth hour, you really have, um, you know, you there's a certain bond that you have from that experience, and everyone's really relaxed. And you often, I had my favorite dinner party I can remember was um, we started talking about the difference between the word jealousy and the word envy, you know, and the nuances there. And it sounds like it was a trivial conversation, but because we had gotten to the point where we we had gotten through all the stuff about what's happening with your work, what's happening with your kids. So we can have this wonderful, playful conversation, and it's through that kind of conversation that um, your your real sort of soul is revealed. I mean, that's too serious, but you know, you're you really talk about life and your your experience and your feelings when you talk about something that's not just the official how I am. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, let's. Um, uh, what I'd like to do, if it's all right, is to go through uh, some spots in the book that I marked as particularly interesting. And ask you about. It. I don't want to give away everything. Obviously, we want people to go out and buy the book, which Thank you. you can get. You can get in great bookstores everywhere. Or you can get it online at uh, uh, MR Media, MrMedia.com. You can get it at Amazon, and, and I'm sure there's a, one or two other places that people can can go. But you talk about uh, early in the book about turning on your social light and about mental weightlifting. Yeah. Can you explain that concept to people? What, what's that all about? Well, it sounds a little new agey, but what people need to do when they, is to get into the right mindset for um, to, for opening their self up, opening themselves up to, for meeting new people. So, you know, I, I tell people to turn off their computer for an afternoon and go out to a coffee shop and, you know, with a book or something else that's not, you know, that doesn't, you know, where they can, it's a prop only. And, you know, like look around, see, start listening to people, listen to what their conversations are and, just start being more aware of the people around you rather than always being on your cell phone. Um, and uh, there are uh, so, some other sort of tricks that I offer, but they're all, they're all designed to kind of get you to shift a little bit, you know, like so that you're not 
you're not always, um, you know, you, you leave your house and you're not always doing the same kinds of things that you're doing, you know, which for a lot of people involve uh, lots and lots of emailing and phone calls and Facebooking. Um, so, I mean, the, and the, the mental weightlifting part of it is that it's kind of, these things are sort of, they're, you're not used to doing them. So, you know, because I, what I t- I'm telling people to go basically go out and talk to strangers. You know, like make sure that you go out into your world. You talk to, when you're in the grocery store um, and you're in line, they talk to the person in front of you or back. That's, an, that's every time you're in public, it's an, it's, you don't want to be crazy about it, but it's an opportunity for you to have a um, interaction with someone, and you know you just never know. I mean, I'm not saying that everyone you meet in the grocery store is going to be your best friend, but in your community, if you start talking to people, you'll see the same people, and you just have to open yourself up to that. You also have to be careful in those situations. To, to, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm a very chatty guy. I'll be in, I was in the supermarket last night, and you know, I'll chat to, I'll chat with the person in front of me, behind me, and. But you know, there's also that thin line between making conversation, flirting, and coming off as a predator. Yeah, no, you don't want to. You don't want to do. You do be too crazy. I mean, you have to. You can't like talk to everybody, you know, without any. You have to see if they're open to it. Um, but I mean, the, the sort of mental tricks that I that I get that I offer people in the book are not things that people would know you're doing. Like, you know, I have like if you need. I, I this sounds sort of silly, but I have one that said that is. Um, uh, pretend that you're from a foreign country and you have to meet two new people a month or you're going to get deported. <laughs> I, that was my favorite. I love that. <laughs> it's, they're just like fun little games you can play with yourself if you need like a little motivation to get out there and meet new people. Um, you can pretend that you're um, – what's another one? Pretend that you're going to be get paid for each friend that you make, each new friend you're, that you make every year. You're going to get paid $10,000. But don't come to me for the money. <laughs> Yeah, right. and, um, and, and the, one of the other ones here that was good was uh, pretend you're writing a novel and everyone you meet is a potential character. Oh, that's right, yes. That's a good one, actually, because um, it, it makes you study people, look at people and listen to them and really get out of your own head, you know, and um, mm-hmm. see, and you can really see it's, it's, a good, it's a good experience. It's all about, like, communication with live people. Well, I, I want to skip, skip forward. This is something that's come up in our, in, in our household a bit. Um, you have a section on getting over your hosting phobia. And, yes. and I know in our case uh, where that's come from is that uh, I've been married over 20 years, but early on we would try to uh, uh, host, a, maybe have a party for a holiday or just you know, have a bunch of people over. And it just, it just one of two things would happen. Uh, the least interesting people that we knew uh, would accept the invitation and it would be incredibly dry and just... <laughs> It was painful even for us as hosts. Mm. Or I just you'd, you'd have it planned, and people say, "Yeah, I'm going to do my best to be there," and people don't come. Yeah. And then you're then you're at this point where it's like uh, you feel awful about yourself, and uh, you. Uh, I mean, we went years after things like that where we just didn't do anything. Yeah, that is that's definitely one of the main um, main reasons people have host phobia. They that and because it really does it makes you it sort of makes you brings you face to face with. Who are your friends, and what is your social life like, and who likes you best, and who doesn't, who won't come to a part of yours, and all that? I have, I do have instructions um, later on in the book about invitations and the process and how to best go about it. For example, in the case of that party you just were talking about, um, you're, what you need to do is so that you don't end up only with the friends who are the least interesting. Pardon, not <laughs> not that they're, we're judging, but um, right, right. but they're what I call the primary guests that you need to come. Um, you need to invite them first, and wow. you know that's the, that's part of my one two three steps of invitation. Step number one is to to invite the uh, is to set the date. Step number two is to invite your primary guests, and then step number three, you send out an email invitation, invitation to all the other guests and the primary guests together. So it looks like you're inviting everyone together, but you've already secured your primary guests. But anyway, um, getting back to host phobia. Um, uh, people are also afraid, not just of the, those kinds of fears, but they're also afraid of letting people see how they really live. What does their house look like? How they how how they cook? You know, how clean is their house? How big is their house? There's all those fears too. But they all the different fears, all the different kinds of host phobia, come down to this primal fear, which is, um, you know, fear of rejection. 
basically. Mm -hmm. Fear of rejection, fear of failure. So, you know, I, I give some encouraging ways to try and um, to get people over their, their fears and, and get back into the hosting thing. And, and mainly I, I, try and I offer the, what I call the five laws of hosting for people to remember. <laughs> and so the first one is everyone is always, is always grateful to you the minute they walk into your door. They're happy to be invited. So, you know, you shouldn't worry about what your house looks like, et cetera. Um, and the number two is everyone has been a host, so they know all the things you're going through as hosts, they, they've been through them probably too. And it also it's the guest responsibility as well as the host to make the event a success. That's rule number three. Uh, number four is no one is thinking about you, they're thinking about themselves. This is like, and everybody always thinks everyone is thinking about them, but like in judging them. But, and then the, the last one, the most important one is to have a good time, and your guests will, will have a good time too. But um, as far as the, you know, the, the whole thing about, um, about you know, inviting, having a party, no one will come. You know, probably you, with, if you just brush up on your invitation skills, that won't happen. Because, Bob, it sounds to me like I'd certainly like to come to a, to a party at your house. So you should put me on your next guest list. <laughs> I will do that. Let me make a note of that. Okay. But, but, you know, maybe you're not inviting people in, you know, um, you're not inviting people um, ahead of, enough ahead of time. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking as you were saying that, that I, I want to clarify something that I actually did successfully hold, throw a birthday dinner party for my wife about two weeks ago. It's the first time we've actually tried to do anything in a long time. Oh, good. And it went extremely well. It was, it was extremely, it went extremely well, and who knows, maybe in another 10 years we'll do it again. Isn't it, wasn't it, and wasn't it a great feeling when it went well? Oh, it was great. It was definitely great fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The thing about uh, hosting is that it, it's, on the, on the surface, it's, it's an act of generosity, but really, it's, um, the, the host actually gains a lot by hosting because you get, you know, a lot of credit from your friends for doing that. You hope you should get return invitations, and you know, it makes you makes you feel you get to show off whatever's good about your life, your house, your wife, your cooking skills, whatever. It's a great thing. Oh my God, people are going to invite us to their houses now. See, I'm thinking I should have never done this. <laughs> Well, if you read if you read my section on dodging, you'll be able to get out of any unwanted invitations. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see, we talked about. Uh, I'm going. I'm summing back through my uh, notes here. Um, and well, this I think this follows on what we were just talking about uh, as we kind of wind down here. Uh, you have a section here, the five fatal guesting sins. Uh, of course, the number one is uh, not showing up when you've been invited. But yeah. What are some of the other? <laughs> the you know, five fatal guesting other? sins. Yeah, you, whatever you do, if you want to be a good guest, don't commit one of the five fatal guesting sins. Not showing up is number one. Um, but that means without calling to say what happened. I mean, you cannot show up, but you have to just have a good excuse, a really good excuse, not just we didn't come. Uh, we, not, we were too tired is not a good excuse. Um, number two is leaving before the main event, which means if it's a birthday party, you can't leave before the cake. Uh, if it's a wedding, you can't leave before the cake or the toast, um, et cetera. Uh, you, number three is to break things or ruin something without apologizing. <laughs> that seems like an obvious one. But sometimes f people feel as though um, when they break something or s spill something that they rather just, if they don't mention it, no one will focus on it, but you should apologize. Um, sin number four is making the host feel bad about the party in any way. You know, this can be done in a very sort of passive-aggressive way. The guest can come in and say, oh, you're having pie. How wonderful. Well, I guess that wonderful cake we had last time was too rich for me anyway. You know, like, there are people who come in and just make you feel like, well, you should have cooked something else. You should have invited some. Oh, so-and-so's not coming? Why isn't Harry here? You know, I, oh, well, that's okay. You know, and then all the, the host is already, like, frazzled, and now they're feeling bad about something. You don't want to do that. And num sin number five is failing to thank the host or host. Um, this is also obvious, but you would be amazed at how many times I have a party. Uh, when you have a cocktail party, people don't have to write you a handwritten note, but a, a, a call or an email, an email doesn't take any time at all to email and say, what a great cocktail party. What a great party, period. It takes five seconds. Um, and if you have been to someone's dinner party, especially if it's a small, you know, relatively involved dinner party, I still think you should send, people should send notes. 
through the regular mail. I say, does it take a lot of time and bother? Exactly. That's why, you know, that's why it's a good thank you. <laughs> Sounds like good advice. I also think that, you know, people who uh, uh, make the hosts feel bad about the party, I think that's the reason that baseball bats were invited. invited. <laughs> that's just, you know, that's, but that's just me. Maybe, maybe that's why I don't get invited out a lot. I don't know. Well, um, the, the people, people who are good, who are bad guests are often bad hosts and vice versa. That they really are two sides of the same coin. People who have given a lot of parties and are good hosts are really usually wonderful guests. Hmm. Nice. Well, um, folks, as I said before, you can find uh, Gene Martinette's books, uh, Life is Friends and uh, The Art of Mingling, at great bookstores everywhere or online at uh, God forbid you go online and spend any, too much time there <laughs> trying to make friends there. But, but just for the sake of argument, because I know that the book is available there, uh, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also learn more about her campaign to bring us all closer together, because can't we all just get along? And, and hear a sample of her audio book at her website, www.jeanmartinet.com. And I'm, I'm kidding, but I, I've actually got a lot of practical information from the book, and I've enjoyed chatting with you today, and uh, thank you very much for joining us on Mr. Media. Well, thank you so much for having me. A pleasure, and uh, ne next time I have a, a, a social event, you will get an invitation. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, <laughs> Bob. Bye-bye. And folks, for uh, more interviews uh, about culture, surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversations with the, and I know this is not proper, but I have to say it because this is what they call themselves, with the skinny bitches, diet authors, or Roger Bennett, author of Camp Camp and Disco Bar Mitzvah, or Julia Roberts, who wrote Motherhood to Otherhood, and many more. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Pointer Online, Digital Journal, Podcast Pickle, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, or Odeo. And subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. That's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.twitter.com slash andelman. But don't tell Gene, okay? We'll keep this our little secret. Folks, I appreciate so much when you give up a little piece of your day and come spend it with us. 